Uh, hello guys, uh, please note that we are waiting for more participants uh, to join this webinar. Till the time I'm sharing our social media platforms link, our communities link and our official website link. So guys go and follow us on our that to upcoming webinars and workshop.
Okay, now let's start the webinar. Uh, good morning and welcome you all in this DP900 session. Uh, myself, Archie Deset, I'm a host for this uh, webinar. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We'll be there to help you out. Moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics is an India one of kind co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we bruise through our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advertise, uh, implement and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding alarm solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained, build confidence to appear for the exam and get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey here. You can advance yourself first to you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced rule based certification then expert level certification. In fundamental level certification, we are providing you five types of certification. That is Azure 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900 and SC 900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you four types of certification. That is Azure 305, SC100, PL600 and Azure 400. Also, we have special certification that is Azure 120, Azure 140 and Azure 220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. Then certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration models and more. Then moving ahead, today training is organized and handled by ATC community. So ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under this ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Azure Tech community for Punekers. Emerging technology community for Suratkas. Azure Tech community for Nagpurkas. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app on your device. There you can follow our communities. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Uh, speak. Today's speaker for this training is Mansi Sane. She is Microsoft certified trader and currently work with Synergetics as a trainer consultant. Agenda for this webinar, you will get no more about the topic and uh, benefit of it. In one day webinar, we are providing you full day workshop today. Then self learning plan, we are providing you complimentary learning achievement best. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated batch. Then mentoring and exam prep session. If you have any question, you can uh, submit a question on our feedback form. Then knowledge assessment. Before end of this session, we are providing you assessment link. You can uh, give your test and uh, check your knowledge. Then we are providing you DP 900 learning achievement batch. You, ju you just have to follow the step and you will get the activated batch. Make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming webinars and workshop. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. She will continue ahead. Thank you so much, Archie. A very good morning to everyone. Um, so we are going to start with the session. So before we start the training, I just want to give you an overview of what this uh, training is about. What is DP900? Why should you learn DP900? And all of that, I'm just going to uh, first talk about that. And then we will move on to learning the modules um, inside that particular training. 
we are giving you all something called as uh, uh, post achievement batch it is not like a so you can call it like a certificate or for that you have attended this particular training okay you can definitely call that and you can share that badge on your linkedin profile or wherever you want you can definitely do that uh, that is uh, Okay, so no, this is not the certification, guys. This is a training of one day. Uh, this is going to it's uh something that I'm going to tell you about DP nine hundred. Okay, in case you want to give the certification, you would need to. Uh, I will of course talk about it towards the end also, so you don't have to worry about that. So I will be telling you all about the certification, how you can give it, because um you need to. Pay for the certification. Okay, this is just the training for the certification that is there. So let's get started. So what is DP nine hundred basically? Okay, it is uh, some. It is something that is. Um, uh, hello, RG. Can you confirm whether you can hear me or not? Yes. Yes. I'm audible, right? And you can see my screen. Yes. So, guys, in case you are uh, facing internet problem, please uh, check your internet connectivity. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I, like I said, DP nine hundred is a certification that focuses only on Azure data services. Okay, and we know that uh, today data has become very, very critical, very, very important. Right. So, we are going to see how you can use uh, the data services, we are not going to see all the labs that are there. We don't have that much time. We have to do a lot of things in one day, but I will be sharing the links. I will be sharing uh, the learn path okay, from where you can study. And uh, all of that, OK, I will be definitely sharing. I will be just showing you an overview of a lot of things. OK, uh, how you can create what service and etc. So but this is like the foundation of uh, your data. Okay, you want to do data engineering, you want to do data science, you want to do data analysis. Okay, this is the very foundation of uh, any certification that you do. Like in uh, you want to do for networking or you want to do um, administration, we generally tell people to do AZ 900, that is Microsoft uh, Azure Fundamentals. OK, but in case you want to move in the data path, OK, this is the certification that you start and any 900 that you see is the fundamental certification of Microsoft. OK, so. Yeah, so you can do any certification after this and any you can go into a role based certification, OK, which I will be talking throughout the training. I will tell you all, OK, in case you do this, you can move on to the next certification that is this you can do uh, this certification after you know about this and etc etc so this is what i will be uh, telling you all throughout the training as well so uh, rg has already introduced me okay so i'm a microsoft certified trainer and i specifically uh, um, have uh, I, I basically train people in the data domain itself. Uh, Microsoft uh, Fabric, which is a new service, and I will be talking about that uh, service, which has come up new recently in May 2023. So I will definitely be talking about that. Okay, I train on that data synapse or it's, uh, Power BI. Okay, these are my domains of training. So this is my uh, this is in my domain. So hence, I will be talking a lot about that. OK, so what is this certification basically about? So I told you all it is something that is related to Microsoft Azure data services. OK, so you don't need to know anything about data. This starts from the very basic, but of course I would recommend that you. Um, 
uh, it would it is something that I would recommend if you all know the relational uh, uh, databases, you know, uh, the non -sequ what is SQL, what is no SQL, uh, etc. All of that. OK, in case you all uh, know beforehand, it is really um, valuable to this particular uh, training okay i mean it is something that is important for this particular certification okay so like i said this is all about data so little bit it knowledge and of course uh, you should know uh, the azure cloud beforehand okay uh, what is a resource group how, what is the difference between ias pass and sas so i hope you all know this can you let me know in the chat whether um, you're aware of Azure uh, resource group, IAS, PaaS, SaaS. So let me just know in the chat box. Like, yes, we know. No, we don't know. OK, so that I can like during the session, I can just give you all an overview. So please quickly put it in the chat box so that I don't have to. Um, Great. So that means a lot of people know what is uh, the, what are the fundamentals of Azure. So we don't have to worry about the resource group and etc. All that part. So you all are very much familiar with the Azure portal because whatever services that you are going to see uh, in the data, okay, they are basically called as platform as a service. I hope you all know what is platform as a service. Uh, mo most of you all know, some of you all don't know, so I will let you all know quickly. Okay, platform as a service. So cloud has three services. I'll quickly tell you. One is infrastructure as a service. That is IAS, which basically deals with giving you maximum um, uh, flexibility for you know con for uh, configuring your infrastructure okay so what do you do basically is you decide the infrastructure okay it is in your hand you get that flexibility okay like you want to uh, decide what operating system you want you decide the size of the uh, memory you decide the size of or you decide what kind of a vm basically okay this is basically like making your own virtual machine okay so what kind of configurations do you want okay in terms of infrastructure okay this particular service like gives you that kind of um, flexibility okay then let's say you don't want to decide the back end you don't want to decide the infrastructure okay what is happening at the or you don't want to configure the servers that are required for your application OK, that kind of a service is called as platform. As a service, meaning pass. OK, basically what you handle over here is you decide or you configure the application. You just click certain buttons. OK, you decide, OK, I want this application in this region. Let's say now we are going to see databases. We are going to see storage accounts. OK, those are nothing but pass applications. OK, and you don't have to do much. OK, at the back back end, the uh, scaling of the VMs, the uh, elasticity of the VMs, all of that is taken care by your cloud service provider. All you have to do is worry about the application and And the data that you put in, OK, like you want to create a database. OK, in that database, what kind of tables you want to create? You get that flexibility. OK, in storage account, what kind of files you want to upload? So we will be seeing all of that. OK, so that is nothing but 
platform as a service. OK, the other thing. The last service is software as a service. OK, which is SAS. In simple terms, uh, we every day use a SAS tool and the class and the most popular SAS tool that we know is Microsoft. 365 or. Or Office 365. OK, this is the most popular SAS tool. OK, uh, we all don't need to. Uh, you know, create applications, deploy applications, configure applications. Correct. We just have to purchase a license for M365 and we get all the applications inside it, right? That is uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, Teams, etc. All we need to do is purchase a license and have a organizational ID, correct? So that is nothing but a SAS tool. You just manage the data because what you're going to write in the word file, what you're going to put in the Excel file. OK, it's not you. Who, it's you who decides correct. All you do is you're taking the ready made application and you're using it specifically from according to your. Uh, data that is there. Correct. So this is the three services that are there and in terms of data. OK, these two things are very critical on Azure. OK, uh, when you are dealing, when you're on uh, Azure, your data services are primarily either pass. And now since the uh, since Microsoft Fabric has come into picture, OK, it has brought the concept of SaaS in data. That is software as a service in data. OK, so this is what is a uh, gist of um, the three services. OK, so moving ahead. So I'll just quickly give you all an overview of DP 900 certification. How many modules are there and et cetera, et cetera, all of that. OK, so this is what we have seen as of now. There are four modules. OK, in this particular certification. Uh, the first module talks about the core data concepts. OK, you're going to see uh, something about uh, data. OK, how is data stored? What are the different formats in which data is stored? OK, all of that we are going to uh, see. OK, then the second module is going to deal or talk about relational data. That means the databases. OK, what kind of databases are there available on Azure? OK, how can you and you're going to see how to create one database, a sample database that is a SQL server on Azure. OK, we are going to see that. Then we are going to see something that is a no SQL database. OK, no non relational databases or data. How can you do that? OK, how can you manage that kind of data on Azure? OK, let's say you have a, a no SQL or a non relational or um, a image file or a video file or an audio file. How can you manage that data? OK, is what we are going to see on Azure uh, on uh, in the third module. And finally, we are going to see the services that help you with analytical workloads. OK, we know that there are two. We are going to see that there are two types of workloads. One is the OLTP and the other is OLAP. OK, so what is what is OLTP? Which kind of services are there for OLTP is nothing but your relational data and OLAP is analytical workload. So nowadays we know that data is being generated in huge volume in huge. I mean, the speed is high. The velocity is high. OK, there are and not just that the variety or the type of the data is different. Right, so which we will be talking about. I'm just giving you an overview. OK, so the date since the size of the data is high uh, is huge. Sorry, the it is termed as big data. 
Okay, it is termed as big data. So nowadays, the data is not just data. It's not ranging in KBs, but it is going from uh, MBs to GBs to TBs to PBs. And we need to manage that sort of data. Okay, so if I have to manage, and it is called as big data, if I have to manage that kind of data, we need different services. And that's what we're going to see uh, the services on Azure. The different kind of services okay that are there which will help you analyze your data okay which will help you manage that big data okay on azure this is what we are going to see in the fourth module okay and in terms of certification sorry az900 i'm my bad I, it is dp900 okay uh, in terms of certification this is the weightage of the sort of the uh, modules okay you can see that most of them are equally distributed but first second and the fourth module is very very important they have the highest percentages okay and trust me lots of questions do come from those modules only okay very few come from the third module but it's not that it's not important all the modules are kind of equally distributed and of course i will talk about more on the certification later but this is the distribution of the modules in the exam Okay, so uh, in case you want to give the exam, and of course, I will tell you all where you can find this information and etc. I will be sharing the link towards the end. Okay, we will be uh, definitely looking at that. And then you have the benefit of a sandbox. Okay, so what is a sandbox? In case you want to practice labs, you want to study, okay, you want to use make use of the Microsoft official content. OK, you can create a sandbox and you can definitely do that. It's free of cost, OK, but you will have to create a Microsoft or an Outlook account. And once you have that, you can uh, you know, um, use the sandbox, practice the labs and etc. Because uh, Azure portal is not free. There also you would need a subscription. So in case you want to practice the labs, OK, you can use this fantastic tool that Microsoft has given to practice that is called Microsoft Learn Sandbox. OK, so this is just about the. So this is about the introduction to DP 900. OK, just an overview. Now let's start with the module one. OK, and module one is very uh, important. OK, uh, we have seen it has around 20 to 25 percent of distribution. OK, so it's very critical and it deals with. The core data concepts of, of this thing, OK, of Azure, uh, not Azure, actually, I will just make, I'll just say it is a generic introduction to data, OK, what it is and etc. All of that it is going to uh, talk about, OK. So, OK, I'll just show the presentation later. What we can do is I will. Um, I will open a notepad because that will be much better. OK. So I am uh, sharing my screen. So I want to ask you all, like, I want to know your understanding of data. Like, can you tell me what is your, what does data, what is your understanding of data? Can you all like tell me what do you mean by data? Okay, structure. Okay, uh, what else? What is a simple definition according to you of data? Like if you have to explain somebody what is data, etc., can you like tell me 
your understanding. Yes, guys, please. Yes, absolutely right. On point, guys, absolutely right. So data is something, to put it simply, it is nothing but information. To put it simply, it is nothing but information. It is something that gives you, uh, tells you basically, okay, about something. Like I want to know about a person or I want to know about the company, okay? I would, first of all, visit the website and I would just look at what that company do, what that company does, sorry, right? So let's say I want to know like Microsoft. Microsoft is a big international multinational company, etc. They have their own cloud service provider. So how do I come to know about that? Based on the information that they have put on their website. So if I want to know even like your names, they're nothing but data to me. <laughs> they're nothing but data to me. Right, your name, your last name, you where where do you work, etc. All of that. It is nothing but <clears throat> information about you, about that person, or for that matter, for that organization. Okay. So anything that gives you information, okay, about anything, okay, is nothing but data. Even the temperature, the humidity. Okay, that is generated from the IoT devices or from real time devices, your smart watches. What are they generating? They're generating the data. They're calculating your heartbeat. They're calculating your uh, other BMI, etc. Okay, so that is nothing but again data. It is giving you information about your health. Okay, about your well being. Okay, let's say for an organization, like our organization, we want to know how many marketing campaigns have we done. Okay, that is nothing but data. So data and we know has become very important in today's time. Without data, we cannot just function, correct? We, why do we need data? Like I said, I want to know, let's say I, ha I want to know how much sales have I done in the last month. How much profit have I earned last month? Like on Shark Tank, if you have ever gone, what is the thing that the sharks ask? They ask the, in, the data. Like how much did you do last month? How much are you projecting that you will do? Okay, well, based on what they will judge that they have to invest in this company. It is nothing but your data. Sales or your profit is nothing but data, right? So why is data important? Because it gives you Okay, insight of your organization. Okay, how can you improve your organization? In which department have you made a loss? In which department should you improve? Where did the marketing campaign go wrong? Did the marketing campaign help improve my sales, help boost my sales? If I want to see all of that, okay, I need data. And without which I cannot project, I cannot do anything, right? Let's say I want to find out if weather is going to rain or not. Based on what am I going to see the weather, right? Based on what? I need to calculate temperature, I need to see the humidity, etc. All of that we need to find out, right? And then only I can project whether it's going to rain or not, whether it's going to be a sunny day or not, right? So this is what is most important about data and without data nowadays no organization can function okay so data is very critical so when we are talking about data okay data has three types data is basically of three types the first type is the structured data. The first type is the structured data. Now, what do I mean by a structured data? Okay, to put it simply, a structured data is a, is something that has structure. Okay, something that has a fixed schema. Okay, it is something that has a 
basic schema. Now, what do I mean by a schema or a structure? Okay. Now, let's say um, uh, I want I have a employee table. Okay. We have all used somewhere down the line. We have worked with uh, databases, right? We have worked with databases, and in that, whenever we have to teach anything, the classic example I give is the employee. This thing. So let's say I have an employee table, or I have a, I have, a, uh, I have data about an about my em, uh, about employees that are working in my organization. Okay. So what do I do? I will give them a employee ID. Correct. We all have employee IDs down the line, which is something that helps us identify uniquely. Okay. I will talk about this also when we come to module two. Okay. We then store the name of the employee correct we did we have a department or let's say salary okay salary of the employee and finally the department that employee is working in so if i have a set number of attributes a set number of records and to that i have said okay employee id has to be a integer value it cannot be a string value. Okay. It cannot be a float value. It has to be a integer value. The name has to be full of characters. It cannot have a number. No person has a number in its name, right? So it has to be full of characters. It has to be full of alphabets. Salary again should be of decimal number because we have, you know, it has to be uh there has to be a decimal number to the salary right department again a integer number no person is working in a department like 1.1 1.2 there is no such department it is like department 10 department 20 or probably if you're giving characters it should be sales marketing etc right so when i say that these attributes Okay, attributes are nothing but the values that you put, okay, the data uh, that you give or columns. To put it simply, columns, okay. Those attributes, when you fix a schema to them, you fix a structure, they have to be in this format. They have to have this data type, okay. Then that is called as a fixed schema, okay. Generally, this data is stored in a table and we know our table is made up of columns and rows okay so these act as the columns okay and they have a fixed structure fixed schema okay that you give okay employee id has to be integer e name has to be a character salary has to be decimal places or float value okay this is what is called as a structured data. It is called a structured data, something that has structure, something that has a fixed schema. Okay. And generally, this data is stored in a table. Okay. This is also called as relational data. Okay. It is called as relational data. Clear? So relational, why we will talk about this later in module two. So this is the first and another example of this is, okay, I'll probably talk about that later, but now it's not required. The second type of data that is there is called as a semi-structured data. Semi-structured, as the name says, it will be, it will have a flexible schema. Okay. Generally, this schema is of a key value pair. Okay. Like when we go to a library, correct? We talk about an author's name, we talk about a book name, or let's say about an author. So that author becomes like a key and the values associated or the uh, books that the author has written becomes the value associated. So let, let, if I want to find out about anyone, okay, I have the employee ID, I can go and search the value 
okay this is the employee name this is the salary this is so in case you want to put it into a flexible kind of a schema you can go with the structured semi structured data and the classic example is your java script object notation okay it is represented something like this okay in curly braces and here you write a key and sorry it was to be like this key and a value associated to it okay so like if you want to you want to store let's say a uh, metadata generally metadata okay do you know what is metadata guys can you all quickly tell me what is metadata Yes, absolutely right. Metadata is data about data. Okay, so let's say you have, you know, uh, clicked a photograph. We all like to click photographs, right? Take pictures and etc. Okay, so photo is what? It is also ultimately a data, correct? It is also data. So let's say I want to uh, store information about that photo. Meaning, I want to know who uh, who has taken the photo, who is the author. Basically, let's say what is the size of the photo, okay? What is the location of the photo? All that information, if I want to store, it is generally stored in a key value format, okay? And the picture, it is basically of pixels. It is a, again a data, but if I want to store metadata about that picture it is generally stored in this key value format so this is called as a semi structured data okay and the gen the classic example is your json is json javascript object notation okay and generally uh, you can find no sql data also over here so i will when we do no sequel i will talk about that there and then finally the third type is the unstructured data now what is unstructured data is structured data is something that has fixed schema unstructured is something that has absolutely no schema no structure it is completely unstructured Okay, no, for, there is no uh, schema. Okay, it has to be stored in this format. It has to be stored in this format. Absolutely no structure. Okay, no schema to your data. Okay, that kind of a data is called as unstructured data. Okay, the classic example is your blob, meaning binary large object. Okay. Meaning your audio, video, images, okay? All these are nothing but the blob storage, blob data that is binary large object, okay? So this means that you can store your audio, video, images, so data coming from social media platforms, data coming in, IOT, I mean, IoT data is generally stored in uh, semi-structured format. Okay, but your um, no SQL data, okay, that is your non-relational or no non-related data, okay, it's data that is stored in documents, data that is stored in columns. This is the columns specifically columns graphs, okay. This is nothing but unstructured data. Okay, and uh, if I have to, uh, there is no data. Okay, that is that has <laughs> structured to it. It is termed as unstructured data. Clear? So these are the three types of data that is there. They can come in no non-relational also, no no sequel. Yeah, actually, it can come in there also.
it is <clears throat> both things. I mean, you can just put it anywhere, both semi unstructured data. OK. So now these were the three types of data that is there. Just remove this. We don't need it. So once you have the types of the data, you have uh, I mean, the three ways in which you can get the data. OK, you can receive data from, let's say, IoT devices or from etc. OK, these types of data need to be stored in certain format. OK, so in, ge in general, OK, now I'm talking about formats of data. OK, in general, there are two formats of data in which or in yeah, you can store the data. One is your databases or database. The other is a file format. What is a database? A database is nothing but data stored in tables or your or your relational data, sorry, your structured data is stored in something called as a database. Okay, so a database is nothing but where your structured data is stored. Okay, that is full of tables. Uh, my, lots of tables will be inside. Generally, it is tables that are present inside a database because structured data is nothing but a table, correct? So in a database, if I'm storing structured data, that means I'm storing tables. So you can have a database which will have multiple tables inside it, like employee table, department table, uh, sales table, product table, customer table, etc. OK, all these tables will be stored in a database. So a database is nothing but place where tables are stored. OK, so this is one format in which you can store the data. OK, that is basically your structured data goes inside this. OK, so you have lots of databases. Uh, for example, you have the SQL Server which is Microsoft's uh, database or uh, software, okay, that has been uh, brought or been created by Microsoft. Okay, this is Microsoft. Okay, then you have Oracle, a very popular database. I hope you all have heard of Oracle. Then you have Postgres. You have MySQL. OK, so these are some of the examples of uh, structured but relational databases. OK. Just before I get into the format, let me just quickly tell you all relational. And non relational data. So if you're storing data in the form of tables, OK, that means, uh, like I said, the structured data. OK, and you have multiple uh, tables. OK, and it is best to store data in uh, different tables. I mean, in different tables, like you have your employee table, you have your uh, department table, etc. OK, it is better that you store it in different tables rather than, you know, bringing them into one. Why? Because you can face a lot of anomalies. Now, what are these anomalies? Like you have the insertion anomalies, you have the deletion anomaly, you have the updation anomaly. OK, so in, in, if you have all the data stored in one table. OK, it can be a problem. OK, uh, let's say you have an employee who has joined, but let's say he's not been allocated any department or that particular department is not there only. OK, well, like if you want to, you know, have a department and there is no employee in that. OK, so that can in one table can be a problem. Like you can't insert values. You can't remove values. If you remove values, you have to remove the entire row. OK, or in case you want to update values, it becomes a 
challenge. Okay, so in that situation, you don't put data in one table. You segregate the data. You normalize the data. Okay, which we will see in the next module. What is normalization? We will see that. So it is basically that you normalize the data. Okay, by putting them into smaller, smaller this thing. So you know, even in a big project, when you are doing a big project, it is. Better that you segregate the work among your team, right? You don't tell one person to do the same task you, or do the entire project. You segregate it among team, uh, among your amongst your team, correct? So why do you do that? Because your efficiency increases, performance increases. You can uh, give the results much faster, implement the project much faster, right? This is what you do. So the same thing applies to your data. In case of in in uh, uh, you know not to store that data in one table, you segregate that data, and then what do you do? You relate that data with one another through something called as a primary key. Okay, so what is primary key and etc. I will explain in module two when we uh, do uh, the second relational data. Just to give you an overview, because whatever we are going to see ahead is going to be in this module. It's talking about relational data and non-relational data. So I just want to give an introduction. OK, so if you create a relationship, establish a relationship between two tables, you do that through a common factor and that common linking factor is the primary key. OK, it is nothing but the primary key. So when a data is uh, when data is really, I mean, is stored in tables and you establish relations between the two tables, OK, that is called as a relational data. OK, but this is also at times called a SQL data that is structured query language. I hope you all know what is SQL. It's a language. OK, it is something that is used to. Query or question query is nothing but question. OK, your. Database, OK, you want to find out the employee details of this particular employee based on the employee ID. So you can write a query to the database. OK, so that is what is a SQL language. So it is at times called a SQL database also. OK, and that is a relational or a structured data that is stored. The other is a non relational data. Which has no relation between the two. OK, or this is also at times called as no SQL. So no SQL does not mean. No SQL, I mean not. I mean, you are not writing SQL. It means not. Only SQL. So apart from just using SQL, you need to use additional things to query the data because it is non-relational. There is no relation between the tables that you have stored. Okay, This is again stored in tables, but there is no relation between them. Or they can be stored in columns, documents, JSON. Okay, JSON format, you can have it in graphs. OK, there is no structure or there's the uh, semi structured in nature that these type of data when you have it is generally called as non relational data. So these two types that you saw. OK, are generally non relational in nature. They're not related to each other. And if you have to query these kind of data, okay, you use the no no SQL language. That means not only SQL. OK, and these are the types in which you generally store that kind of data. OK, so when you are saying you have a database. OK, then uh, you have a uh, database. Database is generally of two types. OK, again, it is segregated in two types. That is your SQL and the other is. No SQL. SQL, like I said, is structured relational. And these examples that I listed down over here. 
So I'll just say tables as of now. Structured will. It's not only for structured data. These are the examples for uh, SQL databases or relational databases or structured data. Okay. And then you can have non relational databases also. Okay. So you have these classic examples that is MongoDB. Okay. Uh, which is used for document storage. So if you have a document, non uh, uh, document unstructured or semi structured data, Okay, uh, then you have Cassandra, and this is la this is something that is used by Netflix. Okay, to store their uh, see uh, web, I mean their uh, films, their series, documentaries, etc., which is dealing with columnar type of data. So columnar storage. Okay, so you can see it is basically uh, Cassandra that is being used. Then you have uh, Gremlin. Okay, Gremlin is for graph. Okay, so graph you can use Gremlin storage for storing the data. Then of course you have Azure uh, coming into picture Azure Cosmos DB, which will provide you these services on one platform. So of course we will talk about this in module two uh, in more detail. Okay, so if you are storing column type of data, it is called as Cassandra. If you are using document, it is mostly MongoDB. And if you are working with graph, it is Gremlin. This, these are the popular services that you have for your structured data. These are for your unstructured or semi structured data. Okay, so these are the types of databases. Okay, and uh, you can Query them using the SQL language or the NoSQL language of data. Okay. Unstructured data is also blob, but blob is generally stored in the format of files. So, what is files? We all know we use files on a daily basis, whether it's Excel, it's a text, okay, whether it's um, uh, image file, audio file, etc. Okay, so the other format in which data is stored is the file format. So you have your class, you can even store structured data, unstructured data, semi structured data in the form of a file. So when you say you're working with a delimited, delimited text, that means it is CSV and your TSV. Comma separated files. I hope you all have heard of what is comma separated files. Every value is separated by a comma or a tab separated value or by a tab. Okay, the T is for that. Okay, so when you work with CSV or TSV or simply put as delimited text, okay, that is nothing but your file format. This is still to be honest, uh, structured data because there is structure to it. It is being separated by commas or by a tab. Correct. So this is still a structured data. Then you can have text files. OK, dot txt extension text files. Then you can have JSON, OK, which is semi structured key value pair. OK, then your blob, which is stored in <coughs> A uh, image file that is your JPEG format, PNG format, audio file which is stored in the form of MP3, .mp3 video is stored in terms of MP4, right? These are nothing but extensions. So something that has an extension, okay, is generally stored in the form of a file. Clear? Good going, guys. Let me know quickly in the chat box. Any questions so far? Please let me know. Put it in the chat. <clears throat> any questions? Any shall I proceed? Anything that you want me to revisit? Please let me know. I will do that. So we are still doing module one, and it is a very small module which we will cover up in like twenty minutes more. Is the pace okay? Yes, guys. Please let me know. Okay, great. <clears throat> 
so this was about the um, types of data formats of data okay now moving ahead um apart from databases and uh, file storage okay there are, there are additional storages also that have been provided to us okay the uh, so let's talk about the storages so you have your database okay uh, storage or how so these are the formats and you can store the data also it is slash store also store data so i'll just say i'll do it like this because you can store data in a database you can store data in a file format okay apart from these you have additional storages one is your data lake okay this is something that has evolved over time one is your data lake so what is a data lake basically okay it is something that is used to dump your yes we are going to give you all breaks okay so once i finish uh, module 1 you are going to get one break at 11:30 which will be 15 minutes okay then after that i will be doing module 2 and module 3 depends on the time that we have and then we will go for a lunch break and once we come back from the lunch break we are going to um uh, see module 4 and then again you are going to get another uh, lunch break okay uh Uh, you are going to get another break okay uh, and uh, once that is done you will then we will be ending the session so definitely you all will be getting breaks so now coming to what is a data lake okay we saw that there are three types of data structured semi structured unstructured data okay so let's say i want to uh, you know uh, store all the formats of data okay i just want to dump these types of data that i am getting okay whether it's in a uh, structured format whether it's csv whether it is json whether it is a uh, blob all of that if i want to dump basically the file format okay it's not for databases basically file format which is of any structure okay or basically it is raw in nature that kind of a storage we use is the data lake okay when you just dump any type of data but file okay keep in mind it has to be like a file format of the data okay where you have to store so it can be of any any data and it is generally raw okay before you process it or something whatever you want to store you can uh, store it in the data lake so basically your raw data that you have okay is stored which is uncleaned not transformed that sort of data is basically stored in the data lake okay so you can dump any format or any i'll put it like any type of data okay that you want to dump you can put it into a data Lake. Okay, and this concept is coming up like data lakes are being used by lots of organization. Apart from, of course, uh, databases and all, this is also being used as an uh, 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 storage tool. Okay, the other storage that you have is a data warehouse, and this is the most important storage that. you know is used by organizations okay this is where the data is actually stored in your organization so but what is a data warehouse so data warehouse is nothing but where you store relational structured data you store your relational structured data but now you might be wondering then what is the difference between a database and a data warehouse 
right? So for that, you need to understand one more concept that is workloads of data. So data has two types of workloads. That is OLTP, online transactional processing, transactional processing. And the second is OLAP, which is your online analytical processing. So what is OLTP? So OLTP is something that has structured data, okay, relational data, all of that, but on top of that, if you have the acid properties, do you all know the acid properties? Yes, guys, do you all know the acid properties? Can you all tell me what is the full form of acid? So acid is basically stands for atomicity consistency, isolation, and durability. Okay, now what do I mean by atomicity? What do I mean by consistency? What do I mean by isolation? And what do I mean by durability? So we all use banking. We do net banking, right? Everyone does net banking. They have bank accounts. They want to transact money to other people or get money in their account right we all use uh, net banking okay so when we are doing net banking okay the first that is atomicity atomicity states that a transaction can either be a success or a failure atomicity states that either a transaction can be a success or a failure nothing between that nothing halfway either a success or a failure so if like you have done a transaction and it is success you could transfer money to somebody else's account okay that indicates a success so that is nothing but atomicity in case the transaction fails okay it should indicate it is a failure that means no money should be deducted Okay, that is the only thing. So either a transaction can either succeed or fail. Nothing between that. And that is what is atomicity. So if it has to indicate the transaction, whether it is a success or a failure, it is indicated through the atomicity property or the uh, feature that is there. Next is consistency. What is consistency? So let's say I want to transfer money to Archie, okay, and I have some 10,000 rupees in my bank account and Archie has, let's say, 5,000 in her bank account, okay, and I have to transfer 5,000 to Archie. <clears throat> so, well, so, I have 10,000, she has 5,000, correct? So, what is the total before I transfer the money? I have 10,000, Archie has 5,000. Okay, so what is the total before I transfer the money to Archie? Can you tell me? <clears throat> yes, guys, what is the total before I? Yes, correct, 15,000. Right, before I give money. So I have 10,000, Archie has 10,000. So the total, sorry, I have 10,000, Archie has 5,000. The total becomes 15,000. So before transaction, there were 15,000. Now what I have to do, I have to transfer 5,000 to Archie. Right? I have to transfer 5,000 to Archie. So after I transact the money, how much money will be in my bank account? 5,000. Correct? But how much will be in Archie's account? After I do the transaction, I said I have given, it has become a success, atomicity achieved, okay? It has become a success, Archie has received the 5,000, 
now what is the balance in our account it will be 10000 so now i have 5000 rg has 10000 correct can you tell me what is the total can you tell me what is the total now after the transaction <laughs> Yes, guys, what is the total after the transaction? I have 5,000 now and RG has received the 5,000. So what is the total? Yes, it is 15,000. So before the transaction and after the transaction, the, the amount has to remain the same. It has to remain the same and this is what consistency means. Okay, so the sum of the amount before the transaction and the sum after the amount of transaction after the transaction has to remain equal has to remain same is what consistency states so if this is not matching that means there is some error go back check that so this is what the consistency means okay now when we are doing a bank uh, when you are, uh, you know, transferring money to somebody else's account or something, there are lots of processes that take place. Okay, let's say I have uh, started or uh, I have initiated uh, uh, a transfer of money. Okay, the transfer doesn't take place immediately. It takes time. I need to enter the bank details, etc. Then what will happen? It will check whether my I can, you know, transfer that amount or not to the person. Correct. Right? So there are lots of processes that take place when you have to transfer money. Okay. So when these processes are happening, okay, they should be independent of each other or they should be isolated with each other. No two process should interact between or should come in the way of the other. One, one process gets over, then the other should start. The other completes, then the next should start. So this is what is isolation. Okay, running your processes, sorry, processes independently, okay, indicates isolation. Clear? So this is what is isolation and the last one that is durability. Okay, so when we are transferring money, you know, there can be errors that can occur. There can be an internet connectivity problem. There can be a failure from the bank side, the server has gone down, etc. Okay, so in that situation, your uh, service has to be durable in nature. In case there is some network issue, it, the transaction shouldn't take place. It should go back, roll back to the initial state, stating that, okay, this was our internal error, network error, whatever you want to say, it has to indicate the or uh, put the error in a better way. So that is called as making your service durable. Okay, so in case of network failure, internal error or, or database failure or server failure, etc. Okay, this has to be communicated properly to the customer that your transaction has failed because of these reasons. And that is what is the durability of the, that is the durability of the transaction. Okay, so it has to be durable so that the customer comes to know that, okay, this is a failure. Okay, yours, there was a network problem or a server failure so that you will have to do back, roll back and do the things again. Okay, so this is what is the acid properties. Okay, so when you are working on OLTP, that is your transactional banking, uh, transferring money, etc. Okay, that is basically the OLTP workload, which has acid properties on top of that. Okay, but what is OLAP? OLAP is something that is you want to do analysis of the data. Okay, that is either a batch or a streaming processing. If you want to do analysis, like for example, you have you want to detect the um, fraudulent credit card transactions. Okay, 
you want to detect the fraudulent transaction, you want to do an analysis of that. Okay, that is what is called as OLAP. Okay, that is put into an analytical workload. Okay, you something that you want to do analysis. Okay, which is not possible in a transactional workload. Okay, you can't do analysis. Okay, but when you want to do or you in that data, you want to detect, you want to analyze. Okay, that kind of a data is stored in a uh, or that kind of a workload is called as an analytical workload, or it is termed as OLAP. Okay, so this is what is OLTP and OLAP. So generally, databases are or data lake. Okay, they are concerned with OLTP, but when you are working with a data warehouse, okay, you store data in relational structured data. Okay, and it also uses OLTP, OLAP, both, but the additional feature on top of a data warehouse is that you can create, you can perform reporting and analysis. You get the feature or you get to do this. You can work, you can make the structured data into a OLAP workload. OK, so that is what is the difference between a database and the data warehouse. Can you tell me that like, on a database, can you create visualizations? Can you create charts? Can you visualize the data that is stored in a database? Yes, guys, can you do that? <clears throat> can you create a bar chart, a column chart, a line chart on top of a database? No, right? You can't do that. But that is possible in a data warehouse. You can do reporting, create dashboards. Uh, I mean, yeah, create dashboards, create visualizations, etc. on top of the data that is stored in a data warehouse. And an important, no, not like Tableau. I would not call that as a Tableau. Tableau is different. Okay, Tableau is like a tool specifically for visualization. It is this is a prime. This is very what do you say? A uh, very uh, basic or primitive tool. Okay, uh, that you can use for visualization, but it is very static. Whereas Tableau or Power BI is much more enhanced compared to. Um, compared to the visualization that you will see in a warehouse. OK, here you need to write queries and on top of that queries, whatever you write, you uh, kind of. Um, whatever queries you write on top of that query, you can create a visualization is basically what is in a data warehouse, whereas in Power BI or something, you can do lots of other things. It's, this is very primitive, not as advanced as uh, this thing. Uh, data lake, data warehouse, the common difference is the type of data that is stored. Okay, in a data warehouse, you. Um, yes, in Power BI, you have ETL, and on top of that, you do the data visualization. Absolutely right. So coming to the difference between a data warehouse and a data lake, OK, a data warehouse, like I said, stores uh, a data, relational data or structured data, and you can query this data. You can actually write SQL queries. You can actually write complex SQL queries. On uh, on the data that is stored in a data warehouse, but I can't. Uh, and this data that you store is basically tables only. Relational data, like I, when I say it's tables, whereas this is generally <clears throat> stored in file format. And data lake is not a technology from. Apache, it is not. I will not call it. It is just come up. Uh, 
it is not a technology uh, pashim has created it but it's not uh, i mean it's for storage purposes rather than doing analysis okay so data lake is something that has files stored if you want to store a csv data you want to store an image data you want to store a json format it is all put in terms of a file in the data lake so you can put any type of data which is in file format in the data lake whereas data warehouse is structured data it's just one uh, advanced feature on top of a database okay there also you store tables here also you store tables all of that is there okay but data lake now can be queried i'll tell you how in uh, using uh, uh, something called as your synapse analytics but still it's not fully i mean you can't do lots of things on top of that that is there you still need to convert it into a database and etc that is there but you can do basic queries where like you can open the file using a query but that is something that is advanced which is done by a data engineer okay so data engineer is specifically who does this okay who and i will be talking about the roles definitely okay so you have um <clears throat> something called as azure synapse analytics and azure synapse analytics basic storage is a data lake along with a data warehouse okay and if you uh, want to uh, query a data query files you can do that using the azure synapse analytics but it is again very primitive okay it is very static but you still if you want to do more complex queries on top of that you would need to convert it to a database or a data warehouse so yeah that is there but you can query it's not that it's not there but you can but yeah for pre yes absolutely right that is what i can we can put it as so data lake is yeah this is what is the difference between a database and a data warehouse and another difference is that you can still you can store historical data in a data warehouse which is not possible in a data database okay let's say you've dropped a particular product or something from the database in a column or a table or, or a, a row specific row okay from a database and later on you want to access that once you drop it you can't retrieve that sort of data from the database but you can do that from a data warehouse so that is the difference between like you can have an uh, advantage of that okay in a data warehouse so these were the workloads now uh we all know data is huge the data size that is being generated is huge and etc right it is something that is um something very critical to maintain to manage okay so when somebody has to uh, manage the data maintain the data okay organizations what they do is that let's assign roles to people okay so even in data okay when you go to a job profile or you go online and you want to you know uh, work uh, in a company so you see lots of options for uh, ro uh, roles that are specific to data right so we are going to talk about roles in data the very first role is a database administrator or short form db a so what is the role or what is the job of a database administrator a database administrator someone who is responsible or manages the database okay who to, sorry who to give who, who to give what access okay uh, who to not give access grant access deny access decide the size of the 
data uh, sorry decide the size of the database what kind of tables decide the schema of the tables all of those things okay is decided and done and managed by the database administrator so he or she is responsible to manage the data base simple okay grant access deny access etc all those things are taken care by a <clears throat> database administrator the second role okay that is there is that of a data engineer now what is a data engineer do okay uh, no solution architect no i wouldn't call it an architect data architect is something else okay if you want to create or you want to uh, manage your uh, this is what i'm going to talk about now okay so when you talk about an enterprise <coughs> level <laughs> organizing or enterprise level data architecture okay you know there are processes or uh, let me say data integration and a movement that you need to do okay so uh, when we uh, you know uh, when we collect like i said there are uh, <laughs> there are multiple sources of data right uh, and data like i said is generated in huge volume size etc okay and this data that is generated is not coming from one source right data can come from databases from data warehouses from web websites applications from iot devices correct we have multiple sources from where data is generated right data sources so you have databases files okay data lake uh erp crm systems all of that uh, coming from sharepoint coming from uh, iot devices social media platform social media right uh, you have data coming from data warehouses data lakes uh, etc okay we have lots of lots of sources from where data is coming or generating right correct so in the organization also okay you have Uh, data some data is stored in databases you have data stored in um, data lakes or data stored in file format you have data coming from social media platforms like linkedin instagram like facebook etc right uh, you have data some data stored in sharepoint probably or etc or in a database okay so let's say you want to do a uh, integration within your organization so let's say my end uh, result has to be of you know uh, designing or you know creating a process okay i've extracted data from these sources once i have extracted okay so the uh, i have got these data extract meaning simple terms got the data from various sources okay let's say i want to you know give it for or let's say i want to create reports create dashboards or do predictive analysis meaning apply machine learning algorithms train models okay train ml models etc all of that if i want to do i want to kind of create a process okay integrate it into a pipeline which we call as data pipelines it is also called as data integration okay we can do this in two types that is the etl and the elt <clears throat> okay so if i want to do a etl which means extract transform and load 
or I want to do extract load and transform. Okay. This all, okay, like if some what from where the source from where the data is coming, in what uh, what kind of transformations or which tool should I use for transformation and etc. And load once the data has been uh, transformed, clean. Okay, where do I load this data? All of that is decided by the data architecture. So he kind of creates a map. This is how it should be done. The implementation is done by somebody else. Okay, so that is the difference between the data, the data engineer or a database administrator. So, if there are databases inside that architecture, it is taken care by the DBA. If somebody has to do something else, it is taken care by the other role in that. So, the architect basically creates a map. Besides the landing zone and etc., all of those terms come into picture. So we are we are not focusing on the architecture part, okay? But that is what basically an architect does. Data architect. There's a data architect also for that, okay? And he uses all these concepts, okay? Uses the various tools. <laughs> to see what kind of sources data is coming from. Data is stored. Okay, and then decides whether I want to perform a ETL, which means extract. First process, if you see in both, is extract the data from these sources. Okay, and now when we get this data, right, when we uh, extract data from these sources, the data is not going to be 100% perfect, right? Going to have some discrepancies, correct? Like there can be missing values, there can be errors, there can be uh, probably you were expecting a string format, um, uh, integer format, or etc. I'm just giving examples, okay? You can have uh, spelling mistakes, you can have uh, uh, some columns that you don't require, okay? Some rows that you don't require inside the data. Right, so you can either do transformation on the data. OK, you can do transformation on the data, clean it. And once you've cleaned it, you can load it to a destination. Now a destination can again be any of these. Types of data or storages of data that is there. OK, you can decide. Once you have got data from various sources, you have transformed them, cleaned it, and you can now load it into a destination. Okay, uh, that is called as the ETL process. So this is ETL, and the exact opposite is the ELT. So what you do, you extract data from various sources. You first load it at the destination. OK, and once it has reached the destination, then you can transform that data. OK, do the same data cleaning and transformation. OK, using various tools, which I will tell you all in shortly in next module or before we start module two, I will let you all know. OK, that is called as a ELP process. So if you want, if you have it if you want to extract the data okay from these various sources perform etl elt that is done by the data engineer the data engineer is responsible for data integration okay basically integration of your data in the organization okay he or she will do the date, will do data cleaning. And transformation. Of the data make it in such a way, OK, so that once this data is loaded at the destination, OK, it can be used by two people. So that is a data analyst. And a data. Scientist. 
Okay, so what does a data analyst do? A data analyst is responsible to create reports and dashboards. Basically, analyze the data, help in analysis of the data, because once you have collected data, what do you do with it? Right, what do you do? You need to analyze it. How much was my data? How much was my sales last year? How much was my revenue the previous month? How much do I project? OK, all that if I want to do, it is nothing but analysis, right? I want to do a descriptive diagnostic uh, analysis of the data. OK, I want a descriptive analytics. I want to do diagnosis. Why, why it happened? Or do prescriptive analysis. What can I prescribe based on the data? OK, all of that, if I want to do OK, that I can do it through the data, through the data analysis. That is, and we all know when data is visualized, it is better uh, uh, understood, better, uh, you know, like in I like to quote this from a very famous movie that is Drisham. What do we remember? We remember the visuals that we have seen. OK, it is very well stated in that movie. It's the same with data. OK, if you visualize the data, nobody likes to see tables and tables of data, which tells you, I mean, it's so difficult to understand. But if it is put in a bar chart, it's put in a column chart, it's put in a line chart, right? It, be it becomes much more better and you can do analysis of the data in a much better way. And that done by the data analy an an analyst. So he uses tools like Power BI, uh, Tableau, Click, okay? Uh, data engineer uses tools. A very popular tool of Azure is Azure Synapse Analytics. Azure, another popular tool is Azure Data Factory, ADF. OK, uh, is your data breaks another popular tool? OK, all these tools are used by the uh, data engineer. And in terms of Microsoft, if you want to be a data analyst, you use the Power BI. OK, then what is the job of a data scientist? So data analysts, helps you with the descriptive diagnostic analysis. A data scientist job is pertaining to predictive analysis. So what do I mean by predictive analysis? We all know now is the time of ML AI evolution, correct? Right. We want to let's say predict certain things, okay, or give recommendations, Spotify. We all know job, rec I mean, uh, or get job recommendations or get uh, song recommendations, okay? Or you want to create a channel for prediction whether a person will get loan or not based on the data, okay? That is done by the data scientist. So a data scientist is responsible to train deploy ML models, okay, Who, whose job is to apply machine learning algorithms like regression, classification, clustering on the data, find out which of these algorithms gives you the best performance, okay, and once you get that, train that model, okay, on the testing data, see the efficiency, performance, etc. All of that, and then once that is done, deploy the model so that it can be used on the uh, on new data that is being generated. So that is the job of a data scientist. Okay, and if he has to use tool in Azure, the tool is Azure Machine Learning. Studio, okay. Uh, this is the Azure ML service. Actually, it's not uh, machine learning. Studio is a part of that. It's actually called as Azure ML service, okay. That a data scientist uses, okay. So these are the roles 
that are there in your data. So with this, we uh, okay. So these all services that you see that I have listed, okay, all these services are nothing but platform as a service, okay. Uh, I'll actually talk about this later. I'll not highlight now. So let me just go back to the presentation. Yeah, you can kind of say uh, AI engineers do come, but now it is becoming different from ML. AI is becoming a diff whole new different thing. Okay, uh, that is there. So let me just go back to the presentation and then we'll just quickly revise, quickly see the presentation and then we can uh, go for a quick break. So with this, we have completed module one of DP 900. OK, so we saw what is data. You all told me it is nothing but information, facts, etc. And these are the three types of data structured, semi structured and unstructured. Right. When data is stored in the form of columns, rows, it is nothing but a structured data which has attributes. Correct. And semi structured, unstructured, have no schema, I mean, flexible or no schema. Okay. Then I told you all how data is stored or what are the file formats, which is nothing but uh, B. So you have B limited text, you have JSON, you have XML, which is nothing but similar to your JSON and the binary. And then, of course, the other formats that is Avro, ORC, Panquet. Okay. Then I told you we have databases. Okay, we know relational, non-relational. Okay, this is what we talked about. And then I talked about the OLTP, OL, OLAP uh, workloads. Okay, so it's nothing but that deals with transactional data, right? Which has asset properties, which I talked in much much detail. Okay, we talked about that. Then analytical workload, and I told all like it is something that is related to uh, large scale analytics, where analytics comes into picture. And generally, the uh, uh, storage that is used is either the data lake or the data warehouses. Okay, when you are working with uh, when you want to do analysis because and of course the size of the data is large in files and in databases you can't store much data okay that is not possible uh, data is not stored in uh, much uh, the size is very small but when you have a big data volume of the data is large it would generally go to the OLAP. okay and this is what it is we have seen this so quickly let me know what is the answer to the first question, guys? Please put it in the chat box. Yes, the first one is rows and columns. Can you tell me for the second one? Yes, the second one is B, audio, video, correct? Can you tell me for the last one? It is relational database. Correct. So this is what we had seen. We had talked about this. Then we moved on to the roles that are there in data. Okay, they have not mentioned data scientist, but data scientist is definitely there. And then these are the services that are there on Azure. So if you want to work with OLTP services, you have that is the databases and the file formats. Okay, you have the SQL, so Azure SQL, which is nothing, which is equivalent to the SQL server, okay, of Microsoft. 
And apart from that, you also have Postgre, MySQL, MariaDB, uh, uh, relational SQL databases also. For non-relational databases, you have the Azure Cosmos DB, okay, which we will see in module two. So this part, the upper part, actually even the storage account, we are going to see. Uh, okay, so storage is basically for file format, kind of a data if you want to store. And then, of course, if you want to work with analytical workloads, you have Microsoft Fabric, which is a latest tool that has been created by Microsoft. And I will talk about it in the end. I will talk about it extensively for 10 minutes. Just now, it is a SAS tool. Okay. So, like uh, if you have ever worked with Azure Synapse Analytics, you've worked with data factories, you've worked with Databricks. Okay. All these services are platform as a service. OK, and the challenge in a platform as a service is that if I want to integrate all these services with one another, OK, like if I say I want to uh, use a project or data factory, I want to use Databricks, I want to use Azure Blob Storage also for that matter. OK, the integration, because they are pass, and even though they are on the same cloud platform, Okay, it is a challenge. The integration is a challenge. Okay, it is a big challenge for us. So, what did Microsoft do? Is that okay? Let's forget the integration. Let's provide. Um, yes, you can use Databricks in as your. Uh, I mean, in Microsoft Fabric through the notebook feature. Okay, if you're aware of notebook, so you can definitely use that. Okay, so Microsoft thought, okay, these are past services, integration, movement of data is becoming a challenge. What do we do? Let's put it into SaaS. The same concept of M365 they have used, but for data and analytical services that are there. Okay, so you can, so you get all of it on one platform, and that one platform is Microsoft Fabric. So I'll talk about it later, much detail. We, we'll uh, talk about it in module four. Okay, so quickly, you can try this out. Okay, tell me what is the answer for the first, second, and third. Please put it in the chat box. Yes, absolutely right. One A. Yes, absolutely right, guys. And the third one is Microsoft Fabric, which is a SaaS. OK, so with this, we bring an end to module one. So let's take a quick uh, 20 minute break. OK, let's just stretch our legs, have some tea, coffee if you all want to. And we will I'll see you in 20 minutes. OK, so uh, I'll just share my, let me just start the clock. So see you all in 20 minutes.
Guys, I shared the complimentary learning achievement badge. Uh, please follow the step and redeem your badge. Guys, if you are facing problem while redeeming your badge, please let me know on chat box. We will dare to help you out. And put done after redeem your badge so I can see who are done with the badge. Guys, those who are still remaining, please redeem your badge.
Hello, everyone. I hope you all are back. Please put a yes if you all are back. Okay, so let's get started. We completed module one. And now we are going to complete module, we are going to start with module two. And before we go for the lunch break, we will be completing module two and some part of module three. Okay, this is what I uh, intend on completing. So, it's from now onwards, I think it will be a much, uh, much faster because what I am going to list down is we are just going to talk about the different data services uh, on Azure. Like, for example, uh, if you want to work with databases, what kind of services are there on Azure for relational databases, for non relational databases? If you're storing data in the form of files, Okay, what kind of store, what kind of service you can use on Azure? Okay, so this is what module two, module three covers, and we're going to see some some labs. I'm just going to show you how to deploy or how to create a SQL database, how to create a storage account, and how to create a Cosmos DB account. Okay, and then uh, so this is basically module two, module three, and module four will be the analytical workloads. Okay, I will just show you all about uh, uh, data breaks, uh, data factory, and uh, Microsoft Fabric. I will just uh, talk about uh, that extensively, and I will just show you a small demo on how to use Power BI. Okay, uh, that demo we will do, but not all demos I will be able to do in a given time frame. Okay, so um, so let's get started. I'm going to start with module two. Uh, Archie, can you confirm or uh, anyone? Can you can you let me know in the chat whether my screen and my uh, and my and I'm audible? Both things. Can you just let me know? Okay, great. <laughs> so starting with module two, this is going to talk about uh, the relational fundamentals, the data, like what is a SQL database, what is SQL, how can you query a database. OK, um, why do we need relationships in table or between tables? Sorry. OK, and uh, of course, then we are going to see different services on, uh, on Azure related to relational data. Uh, OK, like how can you create an Azure SQL server and different types of SQL servers that are available on Azure? So when we are talking about relational data concepts, OK, the very first thing is that we know what is a table. And table is something that is stored in the form of uh, rows and columns, correct? It is something that is structured in nature. It has a fixed schema, okay? And every row that you store is kind of an instance of the entity, right? Let's say you are talking about customer. OK, so customer, you have the customer ID, customer name, uh, you have the address, the city, etc. And all the rows that will be there will be pertaining to that to that entity, and that is the customer. OK, so that is nothing but row. And every column, like I said, is assigned a data type. OK, when we discussed about structured data, this is what we talked about. And every table has something called as a primary key, correct? What is a primary key? So now you all work in various organizations. Am I correct? Right. And when you work in these organization, is, is there an employee who does not get a employee ID? Have you ever come across someone who has no employee ID? 
or um, probably uh, that employee ID is the same for two em two employees. Have you come across anyone? Yes, guys. You all work in big institutions, right? You have these employee IDs that is given to you, correct? So, is there a person who does not receive an employee ID? All of them gets an employee ID. Yes or no? Everyone gets an employee ID. So that employee ID is nothing but your primary key. So primary key or PK as it is called in short form is something that is not None. It is something that is not null. Null told me there is not one single employee in the organization who does not get an employee ID. So your so your primary key is something that is not null, and your employee ID is nothing but your primary key. Correct. And do the do two employees get the same employee ID? Or is it different for everyone? Is it different? Yes or no, guys? <laughs> is the employee ID same for all of them? It's different, right? It's different. Like I can't get the same employee ID as Archie or Nita. Okay. But so when you assign a lot primary key or an employee ID, it has to be not only null, okay? That means nobody can get an employee ID. That is not possible. Everyone will get an employee ID. And along with that, it has to be unique. It has to be unique. So what is the primary key? Primary key is something that helps me identify that entity or that row. Okay, the, the retrieve values of that person, okay, of that entity that is there. Okay, so this is what is a relational table and along with a primary key. Now, I told you that we can't have all the information in one table, correct? We can't have everything in one table. Every entity, like a customer, product, order, okay, has to be segregated into smaller, smaller tables. Why can't we have them in one table? Because there can be anomalies, there can be errors that can occur, lots of missing values, okay, that can come, and then the data engineer will have a hell lot of job to do, correct? So, in that case, what we do is we segregate the tables. What we do, we say, okay, customer details in customer table, product details in product table, order details in order table. Okay. Why do we do that? Because then it becomes easy for us to manage the data. Okay. Because they will there will be not much duplication. And along with that, what can we do is that we maintain the integrity of the data that is there. We can maintain something called as data integrity. Data integrity means the data types now for uh, customer name, the uh, data type is different. For product name, we can you know manipulate the data type according to the uh, table that is there. So that is why when they are separated out, it becomes easy to manage and every attribute can be discrete, can be uh, have a specific data type rather than having a generic data type. OK, and if I want to, you know, interlink or I want to, you know, uh, combine two tables, join two tables, I can do that using something called as a foreign key or the F key. So what is a foreign key? So foreign key is something that is now I told you we have different different tables. We have segregated the tables, correct? So every table will have a primary key like customer table will have customer ID, product table will have product ID, 
order table will have order number or order ID and sales uh, or etc. Whatever more tables you have, they will have a primary key for sure. But now let's say I want to find out I have an employee table. OK, I have a department table. OK, let's say I want to find out in which department or I want to find out more about the department where this specific employee is working in. So let's say uh, we have departments 10, 20, 30. OK, and I want to find out OK, that employee ID E002 who is working in department 20. What is department 20 doing? What for which department or what is the name of the department 20? If I want to find that out, I will need to go and search in the department table. But if I want to see that there should be a common factor linking the two, right? The moment I say, okay, I want, I want to do some, I want to let's say combine the two tables. I want to get employee information and department information in one. I want to get the two information in one table. How do I do that? I want to perform a join, but there has to be some linking factor between the two, and that linking factor is nothing but the foreign key. Okay, the foreign key is something that is data again, and it is something that maintains the referential integrity of the tables. Now, what do I mean by referential integrity? Differential integrity means like we have the department table, we have the employee table, and in both the tables you have the department number, okay, which indicates okay this employee is in department ten, okay, and ten what does department ten do? It is the marketing department or that information in the department table. So when you have a department number in the employee table, let's say it is integer and in the department table, let's say it's float. You can't have these two different values, different data types. So foreign key is something that keeps that integrity. OK, you can't have, you know, values in one table, something different in the other different. Then you can't do a join. You can't combine the tables. OK, so you need Something that keeps the referential integrity does not change. OK, in one it is this, in the other it is that. No, sorry, you can't have that. You need to keep the integrity. And so in department number has to be integer in both the tables. Then only you can join the two tables. Clear? So this is what is the foreign key. And that is what links the two tables. So. What do I mean by normalization now? So normalization is like um, uh, something that you is a technique used by database administrators, okay, to normalize or reduce the duplication of data, okay, because normally data is duplicated when you have it in one table. Rather than doing that, you segregate them into smaller tables and you maintain the integrity of each table. So that is what is normalization. OK, and normalization is. Basically of three types. OK, I will just show it to you all quickly. I have a Excel file for it. Okay, so when we talk about normalization, so this is, let's say you have everything in one table, which is here, if you see, which is not possible. Okay, so let's say you want to add more values into this. So generally, let's say I have a new course that I have launched. Okay, let's say C4, and it is something to do with, or let's say, or DP900. OK, so what happens now 
let's say this is a new course but currently there is no student who has enrolled there is no faculty as of now for this course so you can see there are multiple missing values okay which will cause a problem insertion problem i can't update anything okay if i want to update now let's say uh, probably uh, there is you know no faculty if there is a faculty that has come i will have to update your okay but again no student again a problem okay so that is a challenge over here okay so these are the challenges that you would normally face okay but if you segregate them and you don't have referential integrity maintained okay so here you can see that i can't insert i can't do anything that is there okay this is a much deeper concept i'm not just i just want to show you all examples that is why i've got it over here then of course that is primary key we talked about other keys that are there okay so if you see referential integrity like i said you can't have different values roll number your is a primary key it has to be integer here also it has to be an integer that is there if you don't have that reference uh, this thing insertion can be a problem deletion can be a problem maintaining the schema can be a problem okay so that is why you need to maintain the referential integrity so this is what you do normalization normalization is something that is done in this way okay then there are types of normalizations that is 1nf 2nf okay so 1nf is simple you don't need to know much about it okay you have 2nf and 3nf 4nf 5nf bnf okay all of that is also there so but you know, this syllabus this course doesn't you don't need to know about that okay you can you just need to focus on what is normalization it's the basic concept that is there now coming to what is sql so like i said um sql is a language okay it's a declarative language what do i mean by declarative you don't know how things will work okay how it is doing or what okay you can just ask questions like what okay you can just ask questions like uh, you want to find out the employee details you can just type in okay what you want okay it's not something that will tell you how it is doing it will just talk about what okay so it's a declarative language okay and very static you can't do uh, you can't write your own functions you can't write you know lots of things those stored procedures have come in okay so it's like a, a language that you use to query databases ask questions okay to the query uh, to the database and you can do that in three ways one is the ddl that is the def data definition language so let's say you want to create a table update a table sorry not update alter the table rename the table drop so drop a table okay something that is pertaining to the schema of the table if you want to do that okay that is done or taken care by the data definition language or the ddl okay this is pertaining only to the table and the schema of the table and the columns okay so you can create alter drop etc using the ddl commands so you have create you have uh, drop you have alter these are the commands that you will find over here so one is create alter and all of that then you have the dcl you also have a dql that is the data query language where you use the select statements the select statement which is commonly used select and from okay these are the tables these are the commands that is used in dql okay you have your from that is also from there i mean from the dql which is generate and you can use it for querying the databases okay then you have is the data control language that is the dcl 
okay which means that um, basically uh, uh, who you want to grant access who you don't want to grant access okay the whose access you want to revoke okay all those things are managed in the dcl so it is something that is used to manage objects access i mean sorry in terms of access okay objects uh, what kind of objects you want to uh, access you want to put a lock okay want to control the accessibility to a database okay you know permission or give permissions to the database who can access who cannot okay you can do that using the dcl that is the data control language commands then you have is the data manipulation so like let's say you want to insert uh rows into your, you have created the table you have used the ddl commands let's say you want to insert values into the table or update the values or you want to uh delete the values okay you can do that using the data manipulation language or the dml okay so after ddl you generally do use the dml okay you can use generally select is a part of dql not a dml uh, this thing okay so that is why i talked about dql because select is something that is always used for querying the database okay so uh, all those things if you want to do you want to make changes manipulate the data you do it through the dml commands okay then we have some more features of the um, sql one is the views so what are views it is like a, a, a tabular sort of data it's like virtual tables basically okay so let's say you don't want to perform join Okay, because the join kind of uh, you know do occupy memory and etc. So let's say you don't want that. Okay, you don't want to occupy memory. You just want to view the data. Okay, you don't want to combine and create a table out of that. Store some value in the table. Okay, let's say you don't want to do that. So you can do a from a view and give that table a name. Okay, like a virtual table. Okay, that is. Using the views, so views is like a um, uh, abstract abstract um, form of your table, like a virtual form. You can say simple, okay, which works like a join, but it doesn't store much uh, memory. Then you have is the stored procedure. So, like I told you all in the beginning, SQL is a declarative language, which means uh, what. Can you do it? Basically, answers questions like what, but it doesn't tell you how. Like in other programming languages, we have we can create functions, we can uh, write our own. We have functions, inbuilt functions. We have um, uh, we have the we can write our own meaning meaningful things, right? So if I want that, okay, in uh, structure. In SQL, I can do that through the structured stored procedures or even the functions we have now, okay, which is used to uh, capture. Like, let's say I want to do one uh, update or I want to insert certain things, do the DML, but it is on a repetitive uh, thing. It is something that I will do again and again. Okay, so what happens generally? You would have to normally write a DML statement. But in, if you write a stored procedure or a function, what is the advantage is that you can reuse that particular thing again and again, correct? That is the advantage that is there, right? So that is what stored procedures does. So predefined meaning, predefined meaning view is like a predefined, it's a command, it's predefined. So that is what is basically predefined over here. That is nothing predefined, that is, just a term used by Microsoft, okay, because the commands are predefined, view or select or all of that. So that is why that term is come, okay. But yeah, stored procedures is like something that you can reuse, okay, for a process that you want to do again and again, okay. Then finally, you can even use indexes. So there's something that are tree based structures, okay, that you can uh, 
put on your database to query individual records on a specific column. Okay, so let's say you have product table, and in the product you want to query uh, certain uh, specific rows. You can do that using the uh, indexes. So indexes like or specific this thing, uh, you know, uh, pointing to a specific row uh, for you to, you know, in within that column to quickly read the table. It's just that it just moves quickly for and it is used to increase the reading capability of your database. So this is just it. You don't have to go in much detail okay, uh, about this. Just overview of what indexes are, stored procedures are, views are, what is DDL, DML, DCL. Okay, You also have TCL, transact control languages, okay, for transaction-related statements. Okay, uh, That is there. So one part is done. Let's do a quick knowledge check. So let me know the answers in the chat box very quickly. So this is what is the basic fundamental of SQL and RDBMS that we call relational databases. Right? Uh, uh, RDBMS, the relational database management system. Okay, so simple this thing, right? It's not something that is new. Okay, uh, now what we're going to do is we're going to see different SQL services on Azure, okay, equivalent services on Azure. So just quickly answer this quiz, guys. <laughs> Let me know the answers in the chat box. <laughs> so the first one is B. The second one is C, and the third one is uh, A. So it has asked the characteristic, guys. It has asked the characteristic of a relational database. So, of course, a row, like I said, every row represents what that entity is. Okay, so that is why B is the correct answer. With SQL statement is used to query tables and return data. Like I said, query, read, there is no statement as such. We only have select. Okay, select is the most commonly used uh, command to query the database. And then we have the structured, uh, what is an index? It is the definition. And then, like I said, it is something that is used to quickly read the table that is there. Okay, so this is the fundamental or the core concepts of databases. Now let's look at the services for relational data on the Azure cloud platform. It has three services, okay, on Azure. The very first one is a SQL server on Azure VMs. Now what do I mean by this? Okay, let's say you have um, a VM. This is nothing but an infrastructure as a service, I told you all at the beginning. So on top of the VM, if I want to install a SQL server, okay, that is what is called as a SQL server on Azure VM. So let's say you want, like I told you, most of the services on Azure are platform as a service, which means you don't handle the infrastructure. It is taken care by the cloud service provider, okay? but in an infrastructure as a service, if you want that flexibility, okay, you can do it uh, using the VMs on Azure Virtual Machine, which is called as Azure Virtual Machine, okay, which helps you in uh, giving the maximum uh, flexibility for deciding the infrastructure of a specific uh, of anything that you want. So once you have a VM, on top of the VM, you decide what you want to create, put, install, okay? And if you want a database, a SQL server, you can do that and it is termed as the SQL server on Azure VM, okay? So it can be used for lots of scenarios, like for hybrid scenarios with a mix of cloud and on-premise databases. So if you have a private cloud and a public cloud, you can use 
the this kind of a service. The other is the Azure SQL managed instance. So this is a platform as a service, a PaaS tool, PaaS tool, I would say. So you can see it has been written below PaaS. Okay. That elastic pool, yeah, if you want flexibility, again, like I said, if you want flexibility in your infrastructure, that is why those elastic pools, DPU, V cores have come into picture and that elastic pool. So like at times when you're scaling, okay, uh, you uh, Azure does certain scaling up to it. I mean, till the resources it has. But let's say you want more resources. Okay, for that, Azure will not do it. You have to create an elastic pool or dedicate a pool for it from where Azure will take those resources. And you know what I'm talking about in terms of large scale management. Okay, for small scale, I agree. Like uh, you can use the pass, but let's say you want more flexibility in scaling. Okay, at times people do want that. Okay, so that is why that elastic pool, DTUs, uh, database transaction units have come, V cores have come, okay, for those reasons. It's confusing if you don't know the concept of scaling. That time it can be a bit confusing. Okay, but let's say uh, you want to, you know, um, come into Azure SQL managed instance. So what it is, it is, let's say uh, you want to, you have a database uh, on premise, okay? And uh, or let's say you want a database that resembles your on premise SQL server, okay? Let's say you want that with all the capabilities of backup, software patching and etc. okay? That is possible using the Azure SQL managed instance. So it is a pass that enables you to pre-provision compute resources. Like I said, flexibility you want, okay, to manage the resources, deploy, let's say multiple SQL servers, okay, and you want to provision and keep them, okay, later, like if you want in case of, uh, uh, you know, increased demand or something, but at on-premise, that means at a private cloud, if you want that, you can do it using the Azure SQL managed instance. Okay, so that is helps you like you know create a pool of databases at the private cloud level. Okay, at the uh, on-premise cloud level, and when you're migrating onto the cloud, this this tool comes handy then. Okay, like if you want to migrate your on-premise SQL servers to Azure cloud, okay, this particular thing is a great choice for migration purposes. And then you have a classic SQL server. Okay, let's say you don't want to handle the infrastructure, you don't want to do the migration and etc. You can go with the Azure SQL database. So it's the equivalent of your SQL server, which you would normally install on your system. SQL server where you would be doing the configuration, whether your, whether your uh, laptops have that capability or not, or et cetera, how much me uh, memory it is using, up, how much space does it need, et cetera. You need to configure that on your system, but with the Azure SQL database being a pass service, you don't have to worry about that. All that is taken care by the cloud service provider. Okay, so this is what we are going to see. We are going to create one simple SQL database on cloud. Okay, as a demo, I'm going to show that to you all. Then apart from that, Microsoft has a tie up with many third party services. Okay, like I said, you have Postgre, you have MySQL, you have MariaDB. Okay, all of those you can get in the form of a platform as a service. Okay, where you don't worry about the backend, about the infrastructure. Okay, you just deploy the service in what region you want, what, uh, how many DTUs you want, what kind of elastic pool, all of that you can do. Create a server of your own, etc. All that flexibility you get. Okay, um, on the this thing, 
that is SSIS. If ADB, I don't know. ADB would like, can you put the full form for ADB? Okay, so if you want the third party softwares of uh, SQL, you can get that. Uh, no, Azure database is the SQL server of what you install on your uh, systems. So I can't call it as an SSD. No, you can't call that. No. So yeah, coming back to this. Yeah. So if you want a third party service like MySQL, MariaDB, and you don't have the space on your uh, machine, okay, you can definitely create one on the cloud platform. Okay, you have that leverage on the Azure cloud platform. Okay, so let me just quickly before we go ahead with the demo. Okay, we have completed module two. Yeah, it's SSI, the full, the this thing is SSMS Studio. It is SQL Server Management Studio. It's not called SSDMS, DBMS. It is called SSMS, which is SQL Server Management Studio, and it is the equivalent of your SQL database. Yes. So uh, coming to knowledge check, please quickly let me know the answers. So if you're looking for migration, I told you all you have the SQL server as you, the managed instance that is there. OK, so the uh, it's going to be C for first. So let me just change the cursor. And can you tell me the second one? So Azure SQL database is a pass service and it is something that you don't have to manage. Everything is automated by the and it is taken care by the cloud service provider. And when you're working with LAMP, OK, it is the. Uh, if you see here in this slide, OK, uh, LAMP, that is LAMP, stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL and PHP application. So or something that MySQL uses. OK. Um, so the answer, so we don't have this in the syllabus right now, so I can't explain that. If you are looking for working with Azure SQL, then I think you should look for uh, 420 DP, 420 or DP 300. I'm not sure. Uh, 420 is, I think, for SQL Server and 300 is, is for small DB. So you can look for DP 420 or DP uh, 300. One of them deals with, I, I am sorry, I don't remember that, but you can definitely look for that. But yeah, sorry, I would have explained that, but we don't have time for it. Uh, but you can go for the advanced role-based certification, which has the question for that. It is either DP 420 or DP 300, one of them. You can definitely look for that. OK, so this is the correct answer. OK, so now let's go ahead and see how to create a simple. Uh, Azure SQL database, which is the equivalent of SQL Server on the Azure Cloud Platform, so I have already logged into my Azure portal, which is here, OK? So when you work on Azure portal, you need to have something called as a resource group. So what is a resource group? Basically, it is a um, container okay, of all your services that you deploy on any of the cloud uh, platforms, whether it's AWS, GCP, and on Azure. OK, so it's like you can have all your services at one location inside one container, and that container is called as a resource group. So whenever you, the other term that you need to know is that whenever you create a service, deploy a service in any of the clouds, we have something called as a region. OK, so what is a region? A region is nothing but a actual geographic or physical location on Earth, 
okay where um, these cloud service providers have their um, so uh, i mean have their uh, servers already created huge servers created yes absolutely right availability zones and etc also comes into picture where you actually deploy your so services okay so they have these huge servers deployed created maintained by the cloud service provider so now let's go ahead and create a simple sql database okay so there are ways in which you can search for the database okay one is you can come to the search and you can type as your sql database so here you can see all the lists of that or you can just type SQL databases and you will get the list of SQL data or you can create a simple SQL database or if you click on create. So I you know, go with this. Okay. The other way is you can just search. Yeah, you can search, you can come to the categories or you can come to plus create a resource and you can search. So you can see all your services have been categorized. Okay, into the equivalent like for AI, ML, there is a dedicated category for analytics, which we will see later in the last module. There is a category. Okay, then for compute, that is your VMs and all of that. Okay, containers, that is Azure Container Service, Kubernetes, all of that comes under the containers. And if you want to work with databases, okay, you can see the list of databases that is there. OK, Postgre, MySQL, in managed instance for migration purposes. OK, all of that is listed down. Even NoSQL, that is your Cosmos DB, which we will see in some time, is listed down over here. So now I'm just going to go ahead and create an Azure SQL. Say create. So here, if you see, you get the three types. OK. Or, or the three types, which is your SQL databases, your SQL managed instances, and your SQL virtual machines, which is your IS. Okay, this is your uh, for migration, lift and shift on premise to Azure Cloud. And this is a simple on cloud database. Okay, if you want to create, you can do that over here. So these are the ways in which you can create one. So go to SQL databases plus create. Now, when you're creating, like I said, you need a resource group. So I'm going to create a new one. I'll just say webinar. And I'm going to give my database a name. So I'm just going to say webinar DB. Let's see, it has to be unique, guys. Okay. Now, as of now, I have no server. So when you create a database, a database is generally deployed on top of a server. Okay. So you can. Uh, uh, you need to create a server or if you have one, you can use that. That is totally fine. OK, but here I don't have a server, so I'm going to go ahead and create a server. I'm just going to say webinar server. And I'll put today's date. Let's see if it takes that. OK, it has taken this name. I'm going with the East US region because it has the least cost. OK, cost is all. And keep in mind, guys, databases are uh, generally, if you uh, keep a database, OK, they do cost a lot. OK, so you have to be very, very, very careful when you are working with a database and you have very limited cost. OK, so here I'm just giving a username, a password. Just confirming the password again. And I'm going to click on OK. So I'm just going with a SQL authentication. I'm just going to say OK. And you can even connect to the server uh, from your SQL, uh, so, uh, SQL uh, server. SSMS also you can use SQL Server Management Studio. You can use and you can connect. OK, if time permits, I'll show you that. But let's see. I'm going to go with the locally redundant. This concept I'll explain in the storage account. What does this do? OK, and since I want it's a development, I'll go with I'm just, you know, reducing the cost, guys. 
Okay, you don't have to know about this. This is not a part of the syllabus. Just because I have to use my subscription judiciously, I need it for uh, many more things. So that is why I am uh, doing some cost analysis. I'm managing my cost. Sorry. Then go to networking. Uh, or this, yeah, make it a public endpoint so that you can allow uh, services to come in. Okay, uh, allow change the firewall rules because this is a default feature. Okay, generally, a uh, firewall is applied on a database. Okay, uh, this is something that is default. This is done by uh, uh, Azure. It's not something I have done. So if you want it to be a public endpoint, Okay, you need to configure that and allow all the other services of Azure also to access the server and the IP address from where you are accessing. Okay, whichever IP address you have, you can allow that to come in. Then security, nothing as of now, additional settings. Okay, I'm going to go with a sample database, which is the AdventureWorks LT. Okay, it's a popular database we all know. That is proprietary database uh, that has been created and we are using the light version of this. So I'm going to go ahead and just say OK. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a review plus create. And it has validated and now I'm going to go ahead and create. So a database takes time to deploy. OK, so we we'll wait till the time it is being deployed. You can't install cloud. I'm sorry. It is a some. It is something that is online. That's the thing. I mean, uh, people face challenges. Okay, it's not like an application or something, guys. Cloud is not a application. Okay, you can't install it. It is something that is online. Okay, and like I said, I have deployed it in the East US region and. Uh, the databases do take time to get deployed. Okay, it's not like a VM or this thing. It takes time. Okay, and I've kept the minimum size of the memory. So now let's go to the resource. So it has been deployed. So this is the server name. Till the time, let me just uh, open my SSNS studio.
so that I can show you uh, the connectivity very quickly, very easy. <laughs> So this is your SQL server on cloud, which is called a SQL database. So if you come to query editor, okay, you can start query. So here, if you see, you have your username and password that has come. You can just enter the password and say, okay. And you can see now, if you click on tables, you can see all the tables from AdventureWorks being loaded. If you don't want to create a sample database, fine. No worries. That is also fine. You can just, uh, you know, uh, create an empty database and you can create tables inside this database. Okay. So that is also possible. So you can just say select star. From uh, product sales product. Okay, and now if I run this, so you can see that the query will be running down over here and you will see the output below. Okay, exactly same as your SQL server. So my SQL server has started. Okay, so let's say I don't want to go with this. Okay, I can, what I can do is I can just copy the server name. So if I come to overview, So if you see, this is your server name. You can just copy this, come over here, and you can just say, just paste it over here, and go with SQL authentication, and give this the name. It is SQL user. Give it a password, and just say, Connect, but keep in mind you have to keep the SQL server authentication, otherwise, it will not work. Okay, so it's connecting. So, if you come to databases, you can see your database has come. And if you expand this, you will see the Adventure Works LT that is in tables. So if you see, all the same thing that we saw here has come. So you can even connect to your SQL server, okay, on-premise, on-premise SQL server, if you want to, that is also possible, okay? So this is how you can create a simple SQL server online, okay? With this, we end module two, okay? It's nothing but talking about and in the exam nobody is going to ask you for the implementation okay it's uh, nobody is going to tell you to create a sql server okay you're not going to get any practical questions in the exam so you don't have to worry about this it's just for demo purposes that i have shown and with this we end module two so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some of the module three because it's very easy. It will not take much time. So till 1.30, I will be doing half of module three. Okay. And after that, uh, we'll take a break, a lunch break. And then once we come back, I will continue with module three. Okay. Is it fine, guys? Just uh, uh, 15, 20 min more minutes. Okay. And then we can uh, we'll go for that. Okay, so now let me share my screen. Okay, we completed module two. Let's go ahead and do module three. So this was about relational data, structured data. Okay, we saw services related to uh, that. Okay, we uh, saw SQL Server. We saw uh, Azure uh, managed instance. Okay, for lift and shift migration operations, we saw third party services that are there. Okay, so that was all related to the structured relational data. Now, in module three, we are going to see the non relational uh, data or the semi structured or the unstructured data. Okay, so this is what we are going to touch upon 
in this particular module. So here we are going to see two fundamental things that is uh, Azure storage. OK, what are the different types of storages for your file formats? OK, and the other is your Cosmos DB. So if you want to store your unstructured data, semi structured data, OK, this is in the form of tables or in the form of a non relational data, no SQL data. OK, you would use the Azure Cosmos DB. And what is the advantage of using Cosmos DB? All of that I will list. So what we are going to do is we are going to complete the storage account first, and then we will go after the break and we will see Azure Cosmos DB. OK, now coming to the storage. OK, storage is basically there are four types of storage accounts okay, in Azure. One is your block storage. Which is binary large object, which okay, which is equivalent to the container service on Azure. So I put it in a bracket container. Then you have is the file share. So file share basically is concerned with like, let's say you have VMs created. OK, servers created. VMs are nothing but servers only. But for your for according to your need, OK, uh, you have configured that VM. Let's say between VMs you want to share files. For that purpose, you have the file share that is there. OK, and then the third one is a table storage which is equivalent to your key value pair storage. OK, but if you want to store data in terms of a key and value, you can go with the Azure table storage account. OK, so these are the three types of four type. I'm not mentioning because it's not there in the syllabus. OK, it's called the queue storage. Sorry for my this thing queue. How we have how we can queue our emails and all similar to that. You can queue your data and you can keep OK. Uh, it's uh, earlier it was a part of this. I would talk about it, but now I think they have removed it. Their focus is on the blob storage and something another part of the blob storage that is the data lake. So like I said, data lake. If you want to work with in the, it is generally in the file format. So we are going to focus on these two in this training itself. So you have the Azure Blob Storage, Data Lake, File, and Table. Okay, and then we are going to see how to create a Blob Storage. But I will take the demo after the break. Okay, uh, because the explanation now will take some time. Only 15-20 minutes, but don't worry. So coming to a block storage, it is something that is used to store binary large objects, unstructured data, okay, your images, videos, CSV files, text files, JSON files, etc. Basically in the file format, okay. This is what is called as the block storage. Okay, it is it like I said, it is something that consists of containers. Okay, it has containers inside it. If you see it is you create a storage account and the equivalent to that is the container. So container is a some is something where you store or upload your files. OK, now uh, there are three types of block storage. That is your block block, which is the default block storage that you create. OK, then you have is the page block. So what is a page block? It is similar to something called as Azure Disk Storage. OK, this service is equivalent to. Azure. Disk. DISK Disk. Storage. So like I told you all VMs, when you create VMs, they need specific 
images okay the dot vhd files let's say you have a custom vhd file okay and you want to store that you can do that using the page blog okay so that was kind of images if you want to upload those kind of files if you want to upload you can use the page blog okay but you need to this is like a virtual disk storage for your vms okay whereas when you are storing blobs image files json files or etc you go with the blob blobs and append blobs is something that gets appended okay data in the blob blobs is appended okay like you want to uh, append or uh, like you want to support uh, append operations append meaning add something right simply to put append is add so if you want to update delete the existing blocks okay you want to edit anything you can store it in the form of an append block and you can change manipulate update delete whatever you want you can do that okay so these are the three types of blob storages that are there okay now when you are accessing a blob storage okay uh, generally the data that you store okay in a blob storage okay is something that you might not access on a frequent basis or on a regular basis maybe like let's say you have a data that is highly critical Like your banking data or something, okay, which you will access on a daily basis, right? It is something or something related to someone's health, okay, or something like that. You would need to access that on a daily or a regular basis, on a frequent basis, correct? So that kind of a data you can put in something called as a hot access tier, okay? So what is hot access tier? It is something that helps you. retrieve data or access data much faster okay with the lowest delay lowest latency okay but of course there will be cost high cost this is the highest cost that is there okay but you can get the data immediately okay because you are accessing it frequently and you need to access it frequently okay you can use the hot storage or oh, sorry hot access tier they are called as storage tiers or access tiers okay the second one is the cool storage the cool tier sorry and it is something uh, that you don't access on a frequent basis let's say after a month after 30 days okay you want to access that data like your sales data you want to access on a monthly basis okay so that kind of a data you can store it in the form of a cool tier okay but you need to access that data let's say in in the span of 30 days okay that kind of a data is stored in a cool access tier so you can uh, store it in that and it is relatively cheaper as compared to hot access tier okay you can any time migrate from a hot tier to a cool tier okay that is possible now another access tier has been recently added by uh, microsoft and it is called as cold access tier so cold access tier the retrieval or the uh, uh, time frame is of 90 days okay you have you can store uh, you can retrieve data up till 90 days okay here it was 30 days in cold you have like 3 months okay let's say you don't want to access access the data up till 3 months you can definitely do that using the cold access tier okay and now let's say you want to keep historical data okay or data that you access the least okay like you want to archive it and you want to keep it you can use the archive access tier okay this particular access tier though is the lowest compared to hot cool or cold in cost but the retrieval process because you are not you know you have not access that data for 6 months okay the time frame for this is 6 months or 180 days okay the retrieval or uh, we, we call it as rehydration 
the process is termed as rehydration when you convert this archive tier to cool cold or hot access tier that process is called as rehydration so that takes time to occur. I mean, it takes time. It takes around one hour, two hours just to retrieve that archive data. Okay, so though it is the lowest in cost, but you have to wait for a long time <laughs> to read this particular data. Okay. Now coming to one more concept of block storage that I want to talk about is the redundancy. Now, what is redundancy? Okay, let me just open paint. Okay, because it, if I draw the diagram, it will be uh, much better explained. Generally, this is done in AZ900, but I'm taking up over here also because it's very easy and a, a concept that one should always know. Okay, so we know that in a cloud service or in Azure, there is a region, okay, and every region has something called as a region pair. Okay, so this is your primary region. is your primary region. Let me just increase the font size. Primary region. And this is your secondary region. And these two are region pairs, which are separated, sorry, which are separated with a barrier distance of 300 miles. Okay. And in every region, there is something called as availability zones. So in every region, there are three. Uh, let me just in three, let me just make it a little big. And in every region, there are three, only three availability zones, not more than that. Okay. There are three availability. zones. So this is AZ1. AZ1. This is AZ2 and AZ meaning availability zone, AZ3. Okay, and the same thing in the secondary region. So within a availability zone, okay, what is availability zone? It is basically like a data center. Okay, so what is a data center? A data center is like a big building. Okay, it's like a big building which has racks of servers okay this is what is basically what the cloud service provider gives you it's like a rack and what are racks they are like floors so a building has floors similarly they have racks of servers and how our floors have flats they have servers on each rack of course it's not not a huge building okay but it is in the form it looks like a building of servers okay and these availability zones are nothing but that Okay, they are nothing but something that consists of data centers. Sorry. There's something that consists of these data centers. So every availability zone can have one, two, three data centers. Okay, depends on the cloud service provider, how he wants to assign it. Okay, there can be one multiple data center. So this green is your data center. And the same thing over here. Okay, you can have data centers. Okay, and like I said, the data centers have racks of servers, floors of servers. Okay, 
Okay. So now when we say, okay, I want So we know that data is very important. It is something very critical and we always, you know, back up our data, right? We always ensure we have a copy of our data, right? Even on a local system, we kind of store it in a uh, hard disk or additional storage, correct? So the same thing I can do with my data on cloud, okay? But of course, this all involves cost and everything is there. Okay, that all is involved, so you need to keep that in mind. But I need to back up my data. I need to copy my data. Correct. That process on uh, in terms of storage account is called as redundancy. Redundancy means copy of or uh, replication. of your data. So how can how can you make sure or basically creating a backup of your data? Not actually backup. I will not call it backup here because it's you're not backing up, but you're replicating it. OK, so redundancy is nothing but copy or replication of your data. OK, and Azure OK has four ways in which you can make your data stored in a block storage or in a storage account. OK, four ways you can make your data redundant. OK, what are the four ways? The first one is called as the locally. Redundant. Storage. Now, what do I mean by locally redundant storage? OK. So locally redundant storage definition says that you have data, you have your original data, plus it will make three synchronous copies of that of your data with it the same data center. Now, what do I mean by this? We will come to the diagram. Let's say I have my data and it has been stored in data center one. Okay, consider this to be data center one and on the rack one of that data center. Okay, so this is my data, okay, original data that is there. Now, if I use LRS, the short form for this, okay. So a short form for this is LRS. It is called as LRS, that is locally redundant storage. If I go for LRS, LRS states that, okay, you can have your copy of data, okay? One copy you have made, you have stored, let's say you have gone with a region and automatic, I mean, Azure decides at the background, okay, in what availability zone it will store, in what data center it will store. So let's say it has gone in this data center one of availability zone one, okay? So LRS states that, okay, you have your data stored. What it will do, it will create three copies. Okay, so let's say your data is present in rack one of data center one. Okay, I told you there are racks. So let's say on rack one, so over one, your data is stored. Okay, so what it will do, it will, if your data, main data is here, but it will copy that data and create three copies of it on other racks, but within the same data center. In this data center itself, it will create the copies of your data. Clear? OK, it will do that. This kind of a redundancy is called as locally redundant storage. OK, but now 
I have a question. What if for some X, Y, Z reason, this data center crashes down? Or probably uh, this, uh, probably let's say for rack level, if this rack goes down, no worries. I have my data secured in the other racks. I can get the data from there. My, uh, Azure will get the data for me from there. Okay, uh, that is fine. But what if the entire data center goes down for some reason? There is no electricity, power failure, etc. Okay, then what will happen? Then what do I do? Then this redundancy will not help me. Correct. I need to go with an alternative. Okay, so we have another redundancy. Which is called as the zone redundant storage or the ZRS. Now, what does ZRS state? Yeah, I'm sorry, by the way, I forgot to mention one more term that is synchronous. Synchronous means uh, when you create a data when you create your data at the same time the copies will be created meaning the process will be synchronous with the time you upload your data store the data the copies will be at the same time created okay so the hence the term synchronous has come into picture okay now what does zrs do zrs is nothing but your data plus Three synchronous copies of your data. Okay, but it will be copied in the other availability zones. Okay, but the copies will not be in the data center, but it will be across the availability zones. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay, let's say you have your data here. Okay, it will copy the data. Probably it will make one copy over here in availability zone two. Okay, and other, let's say availability zone three, anywhere. It can make it on the availability zones. Okay, but within the same region. Okay, within the same region. Keep that in mind. So in case the entire availability zone goes down, you have the other two availability zones backing up your data. Okay, in availability zone two or in availability zone three. In case two goes down, you have three and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this particular redundancy helps you at the data center level failure. Okay, it will help you retrieve your data at the data center level but not at the region level now let's say your entire region your entire region goes down then what your primary region goes down then what then we have another survey another redundancy that is geo redundant storage or the grs which is nothing but data plus three asynchronous copies in the data center of the secondary So basically, it is nothing but I'll say LRS plus three asynchronous It is nothing but LRS, meaning it follows the LRS 
okay that means data will be copied in the secondary region availability zone data center 1 okay so that means you have data over here just one minute Yeah, sorry. So, which means that what will happen though you have data over here in one of the data centers, okay, in your primary region, if the primary region has gone down, your data will be backed up in the availability zone of the secondary region, okay, over here. But in case this goes down, this data center goes down, and you don't have your primary region, there is no way. You can recover your data. No way your data is going to be redundant. Then you will need another redundant storage, which was very, very high in cost. And that is, I write it down here, called as the geo zone zonal. It's geo zone. Redundant storage or the GZRS. So this is nothing but ZRS plus three asynchronous copies in your secondary. Region now asynchronous meaning when you create or you st or store the data in the primary region, it doesn't the uh, copying does not happen or replicating does not happen at the same time. It takes time because they are three hundred miles apart. Okay, so it takes time to replicate the data. So that is why asynchronous. So I, that is why I mentioned that that is the delay that is there. Okay, when you are trying to copy the data. Yes. All of this adds extra cost. Locally redundant is the most cheapest because it is within the same region, within the same data center. But if another region availability zone comes into picture, okay, uh, definitely the cost is going to be high. And of course, latency, the time of retrieving the data is going to be, it is going to affect that. So definitely latency and all will come into picture. Okay. So it is nothing but now in GZRS, what will happen? You have your data in your primary region. Primary region has gone down. This has also gone down. So in the other availability zones, you also you will find your data. Okay, so this is what is GZRS. Okay, the durability is counted in terms of 99 point and the number of nines that follow. That is how your data will be redundant. Okay, durability is nothing but uh, how your data is going to be redundant. So it is calculated in terms of 99. GRS is nothing but LRS plus three asynchronous copies, and GZRS is nothing but ZRS, which we saw here, plus three asynchronous copies. That's it. That's the only difference. OK, so it is calculated in terms of 99 point and the number of nines that follow. So the most durable is your GZRS and the least durable is your LRS. OK, so this is the redundancy of a storage account. Clear? So going back. So this is about the redundancy. Access tiers. OK. Then you have is the data lake. OK, uh, now what it is exactly the blob storage. Exactly. If you want to create a data lake Gen 2, 
okay you create it using the blob storage there also you have containers etc all of that but what is the difference there between a blob storage and a data lake is that a blob storage uses flat namespace okay which looks like this if you see Okay, so this is how it looks. Okay, flat namespace meaning if I, uh, it's not like how our file directory works, right? If you delete a folder, right, inside a container, let's say you have created a folder. Okay, uh, I'll do one thing. Let me just look for a photo. I have a good example for that. I have a actually a good diagram for it. I'll just open that and I'll show you all that. Uh, it's the same diagram. Okay, I'll just explain it to you all. So, how we store our data in the laptops, like our system, we have a folder, and inside the folder, generally we keep the files, right? So, in block, when you create a folder, okay, the folder is sudo. Okay, sudo meaning it is false. There is no such folder, it is like superficial. OK, there is no such folder that is stored at the cloud side on the memory of cloud. OK, there is no directory that is created. OK, if you see here, even if there is no directory that is created, even if you create one. Or actually, rather than explaining this, I will show you when we do the demo. I think that will make it more clear and it's almost 140. So yeah, so coming to files quickly, I'll just tell you all. It is something that you use to uh, uh, share files across on-premise or virtual machines. Okay, if you want to share files, you can do that using the file store of as your uh, storage account. Okay, this uses two protocols. That is the server block message SMB and NFS. That is the network file system. Okay, we all know when we have to do a file share, we have the FTP. File, file transfer protocol. The same thing is used over here. And those two protocols are used over here. Okay, but of course, from anywhere you can share files then across the cloud, across VMs within your organization without investing much into the storage. Okay, and all of those things are applicable redundancy, encryption, you know, because we are sharing file over the internet. So all of that is done, but you know, this is just for information. Here also you have the directory and etc. all of that. Okay. And then you have is the table storage. Like I said, it is a key value pair. Okay. And uh, you have keys, you have values, and uh, this is how it is stored. But uh, I would not recommend people using this to store their some semi-structured data. OK, uh, we have another service in Cosmos DB called as the table API. OK, this particular service is very much rigid. OK, uh, compared to the flexibility that one would get in Azure Cosmos table API. So there I will talk about this, but this service is more or less like the JSON key value. Okay, you have a key and you have values associated to that key and it is stored in the form of tables. Okay, so that is why uh, you use uh, Azure table storage, but there is no relationship concepts. This is used for semi-structured, unstructured data, no concepts of uh, stored procedure, foreign keys, referential integrity, etc. That is not there. Okay, all of that is not present when you store data semi-structured data in the form of key value pair in Azure table storage account. OK. So just simple storage, you partition the data. You part, It is something that rows are partitioned. OK, so partitioning is used OK, for grouping related rows, data, etc. OK, and you can organize them according to that. OK, so partitions are independent of each other. They don't interfere. And according to your data, you can partition or uh, allocate partition keys, okay, uh, for maintaining and managing the data. 
no you can't do dml nothing you can do on top of this it's just using the key and you will get the value so you need to mention the partitioning and all of that uh, insert i think yes you can insert dml sorry you can insert i think but look but it's i wouldn't recommend using this it's very rigid still okay you could go with the table api of azure cosmos db okay so with this uh, availability cell sadly is not a part of data it is a part of administration which is vms okay uh, and i can't cover it over here okay so now let's go for a break and once we come back from the break uh, we are going to do i'm going to show you a demo on azure block storage and data lake very simple easy to create and we will do module 3 we will complete module 3 which is azure cosmos db okay so let's take a hours break okay i think one hour is sufficient and after that uh, after one hour we just have some part of module 3 and module 4 okay uh, which will take one and a half hour after that to complete till five o'clock i think you should be done and then you will be giving the assessment and we will close then after you complete the assessment we will be um, ending for the day so let's take an hour's break i'll just uh, share my screen and guys if you want the recordings you can uh, subscribe to our youtube channel Okay, for it, uh, if you want to uh, subscribe, Archie has put in the details for it. Uh, she can put it again uh, for you all to subscribe to our uh, channel for the recording of this particular session. Uh, unfortunately, we are not allowed to share the presentation. It is not a rule by us. It is Microsoft's rule. Uh, sorry for that. We are not allowed to share the presentation, but I will uh, share the learn links. I will share the study material link uh, towards the end. Once we complete, I will give you uh, uh, how you can even schedule the exam and etc. All of those information, I will be doing it towards the end. Okay. So let's go for the break and I'll see you in our hour's time. 